Man Made is a series looking into the journey of becoming a man, and not just any man, a good man. I found those two words together bring up a very rich discussion. It is not a benign endeavor to seek these two questions. What does it mean to be a good man? And what are the pathways in becoming one? In this series, I'm talking with men from all walks of life, professions, locations, ages, races, political and spiritual beliefs. This group of men crossed my path in different ways. Some I found, some men were recommended to me, and a few sought me out themselves. When it came time for the men to commit to the interview, I asked the men this, to only represent his experience, his beliefs, and his thoughts. And the hope is that collectively, all these interviews with these good men and their stories form a powerful story that takes us into a private view of what it's like to be a good man in this day and age. Welcome to Man Made, my conversations with good men. Today I'm talking with Mike Watts. We go back a few years. I discovered him within a Facebook group that we were both members in and immediately knew I wanted to know more about him. So since then, we've talked a bunch, I've interviewed him for another panel of men, and he was a business, my business coach for a while. Just saying it straight, Mike is a good dude. He's a good dad, a good husband, a good businessman. He is a straight talker, proactive, and seeks connection and learning and understanding in the coolest of ways. In his career, he does business coaching. He works with his wife, Kate Northrup. Their business, a couple of businesses they run together. And he's a dad of two little girls. I am positive you will finish watching this really interesting interview, motivated to know Mike better. We laughed, we discussed men's group, fatherhood, politics, kind of you name it, we talked about it. And at the end, we both choked up. Welcome to Mike Watts, a good man. Hi, this is Dr. Juliana, and welcome to another amazing interview with someone I can't wait to introduce you to. Welcome, Mike Watts. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to see you again. It's been a while. It is so good to see you, too. I've, I've been looking forward to this for weeks. Actually, I was so excited when, um, when you signed up. So I want to give everyone like the context of how you and I met. Um, I saw you on B-School. So for those of you all that know, Marie Forleo has a B-School. Um, kind of like online business group and there's thousands of people <laughs> on it but you stood out to me I don't even remember me telling you that when I wrote you the email out of the I do yeah and I was like you just stood out to me and uh, I, I remember thinking I really want to work with him but it, it was probably also I wanted to know you like I just I really go with my gut of like when I see something or meet somebody um that I just get a feeling about them, but you never know online, <laughs> you know, like, so you can put whatever you want to online for your image. And so I was like, wow, shit, one night I was like, I'm just going to write him and just see, does he work with people? And I wanted to know if you were um, open for taking clients to, to coach business wise. And you wrote me back right away. And I was so thrilled. And you're like, yeah, actually, I was just kind of thinking about doing this. Um, so we kind of went full speed ahead and I flew up to see you, um, and, uh, spent that day and we worked together for months after, was it six months? It was, I think it was very close to six months. Yep. Yeah. It was so great. I mean, you, I mean, in person, when I met you, you were everything that I thought, um, that you were going to be. And, and it was, I mean, it was just such a great, great time for me to meet you. And, and I, I love, and we've done one other interview too with the mm -hmm. other guys. And that was probably about, I don't know, a year and a half ago also that I got you together with four other, three other dudes. And we talked about what it was like to be a father of daughters and what all that means. That's right. Yeah, I had one kid. Now I have two daughters. So <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can talk about that if you want. Yeah. So like, so when I was looking at like the idea of like good men and things and you were, um, you know, on my mind a lot. Um, and I was a little afraid, like I've already asked him to do like one more thing, like, should I do this? So it was so amazing to me when you reached out and you're like, yeah, I'm interested in this. Um, and 
Um, and I, I know from what you do on social media and from the relationship that we had working together that you are somebody who is authentic with what, who you are, your journey and what you're thinking. And so I knew that in this interview, you're going to keep it real uh, with, <laughs> with us. Um, so tell, um, tell us a little bit about you. Thanks for that compliment. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I'm also wearing a, I realized I'm wearing a breastfeeding. Oh, that's a, awesome. A shirt from put together by um, a friend of ours, Lindsay Matthews, who runs a company called BirthFit. And I was like going through, cause now I started wearing clothing that like has a purpose. So I have like, I have a, a cap shirt, like I stand with Colin Kaepernick, et cetera. Um, and so now I was like, okay, this is per like, this is what I thought about when I got dressed this morning. I was like, this is perfect. This is perfect conversation. Yeah. So, and also I'm open anytime you're ever doing anything and you need men, to, I'm there for you. So you just uh, let me know. So you don't have to be nervous about any of that stuff. So I'm always there to support you. So my name is Mike Watts, as um, Juliana said, and I live in Maine, uh, just outside of Portland, Maine. So we live 15 minutes north of Portland in a smaller town. Uh, with my wife, uh, Kate Northrop, and two uh, daughters. We have two daughters, Penelope and Ruby. So Penelope at this moment is just turned three, and Ruby just turned uh, five months. So we're in it. and In it. In it, yeah. And so a little bit about, like, I, as um, we talked about working with me, et cetera. So I do business consulting on as well. So we have a company called Northrop Watts LLC, uh, that my my wife and I own 50% of that. She has her own, she has like a website called katenorthrop.com, which she's an author of uh, one book. Now a second one's coming out in April. And the first one was about emotional well-being when it comes to your finances. The second one, it will be about doing less, but there's more to that story. That's for her to explain. And we've created online products. So we've built a business online. We've created some, we sold some physical products as well and managed that through third party. So I've kind of run that operation of what our business has been. And the majority of our business has been about supporting women. And it's been about right now, her membership community is for mother, it's for women entrepreneurs and doing business differently because of this culture, the way we're at has been as men have created business structures and we've run it to work for them. And so now we're rewriting all of those at this, this current day in 2018. So I've kind of run our business. That's what I've been doing. And that started, I started my own business coming up on 10 years in January, it'll be 10 years. So I was like thinking about that the other day. I was like, that's incredible. Before that I had a background in manufacturing. I worked for Philip Morris and I went from working at Philip Morris down in North Carolina to, um, my first business was in the network marketing space that we still have selling nutritional supplements. So I did a completely like 180. I went from selling, making cigarettes to selling vitamins. <laughs> and yeah, so that's been crazy. So my background, I have a mechanical engineering degree. So understanding systems and structures is what I do a lot with our consulting. And that's kind of what's kind of been, it's what my last 10 years have been about and uh, journeying travel. I love traveling been all over the world. Uh, I've lived in, I've moved 20 times in 16 years. We just bought a house about a year ago and I'm not going anywhere for a long time. Like my 2018 was like as little airplanes as possible. And I think I've been on two hmm. and that was just to go see my buddy. So it's like, and I'm not getting on another plane for the rest of the year. Just, it's been so good just to chill and remain in one place. So yeah, my wife and I have a business together. I'm a dad. Uh, I'm a man. I, I identify as a man. And yeah, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a journey. So have a back engineering and an MBA from Wake Forest and Purdue, um, an organizational leadership degree that I double major with in college, but I grew up in Indiana and then lived all over the place and then kind of ended here. So that's How my did you wake from Indiana. Uh, I, when I was working in Philip Morrison, North Carolina, they started a, my boss was because I wanted to like run the company. I wanted to be CEO of Philip yeah. Morris one day or any company that I was a part of. I always had the big dreams of the the big house, the fast cars, the cover of magazines, and I'd be super happy, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, my boss was like, well, you should go get your MBA for to like move up in the company. And I started looking around for MBA programs and I went and talked to Wake Forest because they have an executive MBA program. All it is is for people that work in Charlotte who want to go to get their MBA. And they, the teachers all drive down from Winston-Salem and we sit in an office complex in an office building for every Saturday for two years and we go to school. So I never, 
saw the only reason I saw Wake Forest campus because my buddy lived in Winston Salem, and I just went there when I went to visit him one day. I was like, maybe I should go see what the, I'm giving this this school sixty two thousand dollars, so I might as well at least go see what this thing looks like. <laughs> and I walked around for ten minutes, went to the bookstore. I think I bought like a t shirt, a t shirt, <laughs> and then just left. And then I got a then I had graduation in Charlotte. So it was like, yeah, it was crazy. Um, I, I have a skewed thing about MBA, so I'm not exactly the right person to talk to. Um, Cause I also took it when I was young. And so I think now if I was to do it again, it would be a much different story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I'm from Roanoke. So I know lots of people and oh, yeah. to like tennis camp at, uh, at Wake. I like, I like Wake a lot, but I hear yeah, you. My- I hear you with that. All right. So um, diving in, to um, the, the talk about men. Tell me some of the pivotal moments in your journey of becoming a man that has stood out to you and that can be an event, a person, something that clicked for you. Birth, I think being born um, was probably started that trajectory. I think, so it's very easy to think about the negative stuff. You know, a lot of the, the negative things that come to mind. And I feel like the journey as I would say now I'm at redefining what it means to be a man for myself and kind of cultivating that community surrounding me. I mean, I grew up in the, it was very in the Midwest, you know, it was all about going to school, getting the degree and then supporting the family, making the money. That was, was my programming that I believed. I don't know if this was reality, you know, it's like, what do I tell myself? So, but now it's been about, it's not only just like taking, it's not taking care of the family. Like I don't look at myself as, cause my wife and I work together. So that's another challenge in itself. Like we run a business together, but it's about like supporting each other along the journey. And I feel like for me, that's what the redefining of the man piece has been helpful for me, for me to think about. These are good questions. I've actually never thought about these before. I mean, in some way, but not the way you've defined it. But so that for me is like, and that's happening now. I mean, that's a huge piece that has taken place in our relationship, in our life. And now it's about, it was previously is like not, don't share emotions, don't share your feelings. Like that's weakness. That's not, it's toughen up, be the man. I learned in this, um, I work with this nonprofit here called uh, Main Boys to Men. And it's really helping, they're educating elementary school students about abuse Hmm. and assault, et cetera, and proper ways, just being better human beings. That's not taught by like, let's say the news or something. Right. And so amazing. I love that. Yeah. It's a great organization. Very small here in Maine, but it blew up when the Me Too movement um, really hit national news, international news. They were getting calls from all over the world. It's crazy. So. I take classes through them and one of the classes that we took was about, it was about gender identification and all these things I never even knew before. And they talked about what do toy companies use? They put this word spreadsheet on there and it's like had 50 words that the toy companies pull from when they start putting together toys. And for boys, it was like brave fights, um, jungle, like just all very aggressive terms. And for all the girls toys, it was love, home, mother, you know, it was all these soft emotions that we both experience as human beings. Mm -hmm. But for boys, it was creating these, this hierarchy of domination, let's say battle. Battle was the biggest word that was, that's the most used word. And with girls, I think it was love. And so it's just like such a crazy, when I looked at that, I was like, Oh, wow, that's crazy. Right. And I was very athletic and grew up playing sports. I still play sports and um, on teams, et cetera. And it was, it was the coach mentality. If you watch like anything like NFL and everybody's yelling and getting so heated and the passion behind what's taking place. And so it was very aggressive. So I would say with being a man, it's the, there was a lot of aggression. It's that's the way we move forward. We stomp on people as we, as we move up the ladder, we take them with us. Um, and now I'm kind of redefining that for myself. And I have been, my kids are teaching me that my wife is teaching me that, um, or I should say I'm learning from them, Hmm. not necessarily like, you know, we can't teach our spouse really anything. Right. So it's, yeah. So that's, yeah. So that's kind of, that's it. 
Yeah. So do, when you're going through that, I mean, that's, that's just good stuff. Um, what, where does masculinity and the term and the concept of masculinity fit into that for you too? Yeah. Uh, so I looked at, I mean, I, I had a conversation with somebody else about this masculine and feminine energy piece. And they were like, that's a construct that we've put together and we put in these, I'm like, okay. So I'm not going to look at it from that perspective, but I'll just look at masculine for me, the way that helps me is like masculinity and masculine and feminine energy. But for masculinity, what defines for me has changed the role instead of um, it's being like a listening vehicle. It's like listening to what other people are talking about. It is having, and it's being comfortable in my own skin, right? And so for me, it's been more, this year is for, for 2018 for me has been about me getting comfortable with myself. And it's about, I'm reading this book, now I can't remember the title of it, but it's all about the inner, right? The first two chapters were all about that little inner voice. And so they talked about when you buy a new car, and then you sit in the car and be like, maybe I should have got that one or that one or that one. You know, it's like we re always challenge ourselves or I could be sitting here talking to you. And then I'm thinking about the conference call I got later today, or it's this, this inner voice that keeps playing us. And so for me, it's masculinity as being the true vehicle for myself of who I am, who I am and knowing what that is. Mm -hmm. um, and then also from an action standpoint, so it's like, it is the doing piece. It's the doing stuff of myself. It's like me going out and to do things. Um, I don't know. I, that's, a, I, that's, that's, I said, another good question. I don't have, I guess maybe it'd be helpful if I define these for myself, but. What yeah. about, this is something I've, I've thought too. Like if I were to have asked you this when you were 16, like, what does it mean to be masculine? How yeah. do you think that would have been different at 16 than it is right now? Oh, totally. It's about um, making it like it's power, right? It's about the power piece. It's about competition. It's about beating everybody else. It's about, it's for, for me was also, I was also confused when I think of 16 years old, when I started smoking a lot of weed and I started drinking and I was very confused. I was intertwined because I had a, a dad who, who in my mind was very angry a lot when he would come home, et cetera. And then, or that's what I remember a lot of. And then I had a mom who raised three children, right? My dad traveled all over the world while we worked. So it was bouncing back and forth between like the caretaking aspect of my mother and then this domination piece and control of what fatherhood quote unquote is yeah. right. And, or that's the way it was at that time. And or still is today in many ways, right? So, or that's the way we're, we're rolling. So I feel like at that time was about, it was power. It was like, this is how we're gonna run the show. This is what we're gonna do. My buddies used to get in fights all the time. I never understood it. I, didn't, I thought it was dumb. Um, I was just like, why are you, I don't understand why you guys are fighting. So it's like this piece of like MMA, or it's like I watch boxing and I feel like, and it's sports and it's athletics and it's participating in these programs. And that's to me would have defined more of the masculinity piece. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then sleeping with as many women as you possibly can, because that's a badge of honor. A conquest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, conquest. That's perfect. I keep going back to what you just said about battle being the number one word um, in, in toys. I, mean, I, I think that is that concept of battle is threaded throughout so much of masculinity, even not even in the most obvious of senses, but even just like we've just said about conquering, you know, having, having all these conquests with women I mean, even that can feel like a battle mm -hmm. um, that you're gaining trophies and um, along the way. What are, so what are, what do you think are, is the best part or the, or the good part about being a man in, in this day and age? Right now? Mm -hmm. Um, you could be a great leader to help other people. Like, I feel like there's no other, I, I, there's massive transition that's taking place right now in my view of like the, the intersection between men were the sole providers or breadwinners for a really long time. What's funny though, is they weren't because when they went to war, women ran everything, but then men came back from war after world war II and took it all back over. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like such a, it's such a, crazy system right it's such a crazy thing to think about when you think of the history of what actually took place and it was and i think there's so much changing that's happening right now and i feel like at this time it's so i love being it i love being this for my daughter 
um, like being a good dad for my daughter and showing up for her. Cause I think of these, this is the, this kind of sums it up the way I view it right now is like the Kavanaugh things coming out is happening right now. Like him possibly running for Supreme court. And I'm just like in all of the, it's like, I just be like, we'll just be like men. There's a way that the toxic masculinity is, is per, it's all over the place. It's dominating the news. It's dominating po politics. It's been all over Hollywood and where it's like that to me. Now this is the way I think it, it's like, I'm teaching my daughters to not put up with this bullshit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, that's the way I'm going to, that's the way I will, I can't say I'm going to teach them that, right? I don't look at them teaching my kids anything. They're teaching me more than anything, but it's for me to just be myself. And then they're going to reflect that in the world. You're so that's why. You're giving environment where they will yes. apparently know no more of this bullshit. Yes. And so that's where, for me, I feel like that's the place that we're at a good spot here. And there is a lot of negativity that's out there, but there's also a lot of place for us to grow. Like for our company, we, we put the whole company through uh, this program called Diversity as an Asset. Um, Cause we're mainly a white organization and um, we have one person of two people of color on our team. And then like majority of them are white men and white women. And it's balanced between men and women. And, but it was us for it's good learning for me to realize like I'm a white man. I've been the patriarchy. I have, run the show, you know, or are, are us as dudes. So for me, it's been this lesson of learning that I've never experienced before. And that's where I'm really happy to be a man right now. And it allows me to step up to realize, to show people as well, there is good people that are here. There's good dudes in the world mm -hmm. and just me. And so I know that that is exuded for, for me learning about more of who I am. And as long as I can continue project, not project, but just be myself and not try to be somebody that I'm not. And I feel like that was the piece that that's been a, a big transition for me over the last 10 years uh, as, as this going from the guy that wanted to be on the cover of the magazines, the Ferraris, the cars, and like have all of that. Maybe one day I can buy it all. Great. But that's not going to determine like that doesn't define who I am. That's just stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's, yeah. So that's kind of why I'm excited about it. And what's, what's crazy is like all of the stuff that's happening in the news and that you read, you hear, it's like men are bad or whatever is taking place. Mm -hmm. All of my friends that I hang out with that I actually have real conversations with and the people that like, we just moved in this brand new neighborhood that there's 26 brand new homes being built. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's moving in there that I'm hanging out with, we are having conversations like this. Yeah. And there's no way at 16 years old when I was having these conversations, there's nowhere five years ago I was having conversations like this, mm -hmm. but like, it's me and my buddies talking about, um, patriarchy. It's me and my buddies talking about the me too movement. It's, it's mistreatment of what's been taking place. And it's a really, and then I'm also finding men who are now, um, like I have friends that just moved here from out of state and he's not working, but his wife is working. And so this is the first time he's been in a situation like this. And it's been an, it just that dialogue of him. To, like, he's trying to find himself. He did this exercise about writing his own eulogy. And he's like, what is going on here? He's like, I'm just trying to like, who am I? Like, what have I been created? And so that what I find is like, it's very hopeful for the future because there's a lot of negativity that goes on there. Um, but I could say it's also hard, right? It's also very challenging. And it's been very challenging for me um, that's been through since having a kid, some, I've had this crazy journey with my skin lately. I had a kinesiologist tell me that I don't have to try to take the responsibility of the entire male gender and try to fix it. Like that's not my response. The white male gender, the straight white male gender, and that's my responsibility to fix it because of slavery or the mistreatment or sexual abuse or abuse towards women, period. Like it's not my responsibility is to take care of myself. And I would say that was the most helpful thing for her because I, I'm empathetic to women because our business has been all about women, right? Like our business has been what, so I've heard these stories for uh, 10 years now, Yeah, you know, of everything that ha has gone on and just like how women are operating in business and going through this process. But I was like, oh my God, I got to say, and then I've had friends that have gone through divorce, really close friends that have gone through divorce. And I, and I hear their stories about, what it was like for their husbands 
and what it was like for their partners. And then for, as for me, I just like, okay, I got to be better. And then I o- try to over deliver to Kate or over deliver the world. And it's exhausting for me. It creates more stress. So for me, it's also been this hard piece where this is something I have, I, I would imagine during this interview series, you probably come up with a theory that you could put together around this, but it's not something I've actually talked to too many guys about that they take um, how they feel about it. It's just something that I noticed for myself because I felt like the whole male gender was being attacked or it was being, you know, and these are thoughts that have went through my head and it's just like, okay, so now we all have to do what now I can't talk to anybody. I can't give somebody a hug. You know, you can't ask. So it's, it's, but it's, it's challenging everything that's existed before, which is good, but it's also, we have to revamp kind of the way that we lived our life. So it also becomes a challenge for, men i would say in this day and age because it is a massive transition with the with i mean a couple of years ago what was it like five or eight years ago where women were going to college there's more women applying for college than there was men like getting into college and now we're at a place there's more women that are going to be running in the political uh office than ever before right now for political office and there's i mean women are going to continually it's not that they're taking jobs from men right but they're it's they will continually be a vast part of society that is quote unquote has been given this like making money at a job has always looked more highly than like taking care of four kids, which is insane in my book because I pretty much see my kids every single day. It is way harder to do that than it is to like sit on my computer and type a blog post, you know, like taking care of two daughters is like, enormously harder than me were writing a blog post, you know? So I'm just like, wow, we've really been messed up here, but it's going to create more of a balance. And I think it's going to be better. You know, it is going to be better for society. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think part, I think threaded throughout that too is as, as we start shifting things and it's already shifting, not as we, but like, you know, as it's shifting and as, as people are trying to figure it out and having those private conversations and larger, more public conversations is how, how do you find that balance in your own life, in your own skin, as well as out in your relationships in the community without it feeling like something being taken from you, especially if we go back to the word battle, if everything feels like that. If it is a yours or mine, instead of a, like, let's figure this out together. And, and what I, I, it'd be so cute. I mean, I would love like to sit like with your group of friends in that neighborhood and have these kind of discussions. And, and f- because I bet the values, the backgrounds like, will be different as to what does that mean? Mm-hmm. How, how does that sift it through? And I've talked to several men um, in the series already who are more like more considered stay at home dads or the, the um, their spouses are, are making more money. And they talk about like how, like one of, one of the guys said, he's like, you know, I, I, um, I put a straw in a juice box and it's like all the moms on the playground, like throw a parade for me. Like, Oh my God, like, it's amazing. And he's like, you know, first of all, I feel mad for my wife. That's insulting as shit that, you know, nothing's going to happen for her because she's done the juice box. I mean, she's got to do that. And she runs three vet clinics and, and he's like, and then like, kind of like, fuck you. Like, of course I should know how to do this. And he wasn't literally just being the juice box, but he's like, yep. you know, just showing up as a dad is um, I, why, why is that so unique and special and different? He said, but then conversely, he said he actually gets more shit from women that he's not working and making them like working or, or bringing in the money than he does from dudes. So he's like, most of my guy friends are like, God, I wish I could do that. And um, until they spend two days home and they're mm-hmm. like, okay, okay. <laughs> you know, forgot how hard this is <laughs> with it. But again, it's like all those interesting conversations and negotiations that we have. And if we're all doing that privately, what does that mean for us collectively? Um, and then you add all the worldly hurt of the past that you talked about, the collective pain um, in history. And in some ways, it seems insurmountable. But every time I had these discussions, I'm like, no, this is, these are the solutions. I mean, th- this mm-hmm. is how things are changing. And it's, it's talking and having people, men like you, who are, um, are doing the good work, which is to me, the good work is asking these questions without fear. And even if you have the fear, like just doing it, just asking, asking each other. And, and I've asked men too about male friendships, because there's such a stereotype, especially for older, like maybe like mid forties um, up, you know, for older generations that male friendships aren't very meaningful or deep no. and rich. And that's not the case. 
um, in, in a lot of ways, I do think that um, like the men that I'm speaking to and the men who I have seen as like the good, and we'll get into what that means, um, do have relationships, male friendships that matter. And, and I'm wondering too, if that's part of the key too. like, you're right. I have a theory. I have some theories going <laughs> through it and male friendships is one of them. I agree. I mean, I just heard a statistic yesterday that probably 50% of men that are over the age of 35 don't have, it was by Chip Conley and he was interviewed on this guy's podcast called uh, Cal Fussman and Chip's actually starting a, he started Jart. Joe V. I'm going to say this completely wrong, but it was a hotel chain. It's like a, the second biggest boutique hotel chain in the United States. I think it's maybe in the world. I don't know. Anyway, there's 52 of these things. He sold it off. He had this near death experience, but he said middle age now is really 35 to 70 is what he considers middle age. And he's doing, he opened a place that's like uh, the canyons in Tucson. It's like a the spa, right? Mm -hmm. And he opened a place like that, but for midlife. And it's a place in Mexico that you can go if you're transitioning to like what's next. But he said that there's probably 50% of men over the age of 40 that don't have somebody they could call and talk to them, like as a friend. Yeah, that's and sad. It's, well, that's also like why suicide rate has been yeah. increasing for men at all ages. Mm -hmm. You know, the mass killings that have taken place that are all basically white men. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like all of these statistics add up to be like, there's a problem here. Yeah. And it's like one, one thing. And so it is a, a place of friendship, you know? And it's like, as, as we get more comfortable with ourselves, being able to express this to other people, because there, it's, there wasn't that, right? It has been that, it goes back to that battle piece. Like if we're always, if we're taught that we're always a battle with people, um, then we're never going to let in, in emotions was a vulnerability or being vulnerable is weakness. And I agree. Like Kate and I had a, a session with our therapist because it's been a journey in our own relationship with my wife. Kate's my wife. I said that at the beginning, but just to remind the listener, the, we had a conversation about like, if I'm going to be vulnerable, I told her this, like if I, if you want me to share my feelings and you want me to let you in, then I can't have judgment. I will listen to you go on for 20 minutes about your external processing and I need this and I need to talk about it and I need to go out and I don't say shit, right? <laughs> I just sit there and listen and I let it half the, most of the time I can hear it. She's like, are you even listening to me? I will literally gave, she'll talk for like 15 minutes straight and I will tell her not word for word, but all the highlights that she talked about and I can just repeat them back to her, you know, and I don't have judgment. I don't have like, yeah, I already know. There's no, it's just like, but if it was me in reverse, and I'm like, I'm scared. Let's just take an example. It'd be like, I, how are we going to pay our bills at the end of the month, right? From a money standpoint. And I feel scared about that. And then she starts locking up or I notice she gets very t tension inside of her system. Then all of a sudden I start getting more tension because, oh my God, like I'm letting my wife down. I'm letting my kids down, letting my family down. And then I'm like, I can't bring vulnerability to you if that's the reaction that's going to happen. So the, the part that you talked about with guys of like the women in their lives, it's very true because- both of us have programming of what's going on yeah. uh, that's been in depth, not only us, but also societal, but also DNA that carries on from our mothers, our grandfathers, our, you know, once they're doing more of this epigenetics conversation, more research, realize how much this carries on. And it's huge. And so for me, it has been defined and it's, and it's moved. It's been fluid. I don't have like childhood friends that I still talk to, you know, mine have changed over time. And then once I started my business, that put me in a different category than guys that I could hang out with. Now for me, it's also been here living in Maine. It's like, who can I hang out with during the day? Yeah. And because it's like, I have a pretty fluid schedule. It's up to myself. So it's like, who can I have lunch with? You know, who can I go do this with? So that has been something and having those pieces. And I actually built a, cause I wanted that when I moved to Maine, our first two years here, we were gone more because we traveled so much that we we're actually here. So it's hard to build connections with someone but then I created this group called do man shit. And there's now like 25 dudes on there, right. That it just keeps adding to it. And so last hey, what year, do, what do you do? We do man shit. We go like bowling, you know, <laughs> or we play <laughs> poker. When was the other poker? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do poker. We did, what else did we do? We did uh, something else that now I can't remember, but it's like, and then some guys just got together. We went out to eat, you know, just had a meal together and just chatted 
Um, so it's just, and then I sent them the stuff like the main voice and men group I was talking about. I sent them all the stuff and I'm like, this is coming up. If you guys want to participate, here you go. You know, but it's just us getting together once a month and just, it was once a month. It's been a little more sporadic now, but it's, it's still there. The container's still there mm-hmm. for us to just hang out. Cause I wanted to be around more guys. Cause I was always with Kate and with my daughter yeah. and I was like, I need to get out of here. Like, so we'll go paddle boarding or just do a meetup or something like that sometimes. So for me, it's, but it's been a place where cultivation, I think watching Kate go through this process, she's always been super, we're both extrovert. So like creating community of people has always been our, has been for us. For her, since she became a mom, what I've noticed, it's like, it's really, it's just funny how you just, you know, it's, you're with, I just heard this on the comedians and cars getting coffee with Jerry Seinfeld and this other guy who's interviewing, but he's like, yeah, I'm friends with, it was Seth Meyers. You know, he, this one of this, the guy who, the comedian was on there was with Seth Meyers. He goes, I'm friends with all of these people until they have children and they just disappear, yeah. you know, because he doesn't have kids. Yeah. And so as that, as Kate's navigated those waters as being a new mom, that's really been a little bit of a challenge for her because of, uh, but she's been able to do it. But it's like, as you, you just navigate in these new buckets. Yeah. And so now I'm a mother with these kids. So like, who are, find my people. And that's what's happened that I've had to realize over time because I had, as I moved around the country, I always had one or two people that I could chat with those locally. And so I always wanted that in Maine. So I kind of just cultivated myself. Um, And out of that, I would say there's probably, you know, I wouldn't say there's good buddies, but it's like we go to lunch every once in a while. You know, it's not somebody, but I have a really good friend in Chicago. We talk to each other about all sorts of stuff, but it's always fluid and moving and I'm comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And I, mean, I and what I've heard like from the men that I've been interviewing that um, especially those who are like mid 40s and younger are saying like those the, those are really it's impo- it's just crucial to have someone that you can actually be real with and a dude that's that that yeah. is getting it um, and how much of a difference that makes and and some have said it doesn't matter if I haven't spoken to them in a year but I can call them up and say I am in it I'm in yes. it and I need you to listen and, or like, I actually need money. Can you do it without judging me? And can you, you know, wire it to me tomorrow or whatever it is. And he's like, to know you have that. And again, I think it's that we have it. We, we haven't had let, or we haven't supported men in having connections. Um, mm-hmm. Correct. Yeah. The same way um, that we do women. And I don't think men have been nurtured to see the importance of connection um, and what that can do for your health, what that can do for your emotional well being, um, and, and all sorts of happiness um, within you. And I think that's part of the key, too, is allowing that and teaching men to have that. Um, so when I talk to you about um, like good men, what, what is your reaction to that phrase, those two words being together? For me, the the first thing that comes to mind is is being kind. It's just it's because that's my transition I've I've going through. I uh, not that I was an asshole or anything previously, but I always had this guard up, mm-hmm. right? I always thought somebody was going to, especially when Kate and I started working together, because I started working with her in an environment where she had a bigger platform than I did. I ran our operations of our company, and then we put her on the pet. You know, she was kind of the public figure for a while. Right. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was an adjustment that I needed to make for myself. And I was always very protective of her. And, but now it's like, think of good men. It's like, that has been our, it's this, she always said I had this tone thing. And so this is why this all comes to mind when you ask about good, but it's like, it's kindness and listening at the same piece. That's what I am realizing, especially now. I mean, think about the me too, and I've been reading all of these books about um, just being black in the United States, like being a co- person of color in the United States and what that is like. I'm reading these written by men. I'm reading these written by women. And just, I have no clue. Like it's, it's, you know, I knew there was a play, like I knew there was hardship, you know, with slavery, right? That's, that's obvious. But it's like you start paying attention and just listening to this. So if I was to say three things with good men, it's definitely learning about kindness, that emotions are not bad. Somebody that can actually talk about what's really going on and comfort. They're a person that's comfortable in their own skin of who they are. And um, yeah, it's like listening. That's what I would kind of sum it up. I could tell a longer story about it, but I feel like that's 
mm -hmm. answers the question in a more direct format. What's the opposite? Donald Trump. <laughs> 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 you know, it's funny you say that because I um, had, like I told you, like I've got this five types of men that I've been working on and I, and number four, I could, I have like clever names for all of them that I'm working on and I couldn't get past this fourth, it was, I just kept saying Trump and everyone knows, you know, pretty much what that is, whether you side politically or, or whatever with him. So you just know what I'm talking about when you say Trump. So I, anyway, I laugh when you say this, like it's just, it's becoming its own adjective. It is because it's, it's what's crazy about it is that everybody can follow, but there's an element that if the battle piece is what we're taught as a kid, that is the success, right? When you look at it and be like, this guy came from money, right? He didn't come from nothing, mm -hmm. but he came from money. And then he worked his way up and built these companies, quote unquote. And that it's, it was, didn't matter how he got there. Like he didn't pay. It's like when you really dig in the history of what this guy created, he didn't really create much and he took advantage of a lot of people. But, but I didn't know this, right? I didn't really know this until about three, four years ago when I started really digging into his past and started reading about the history of what the Trump organization was and his father and his father and his grandfather and how like corrupt and toxic it really was. But like, He's a reflection of this toxic masculinity piece that he just saw from an environment of his dad. He learned how to play the system. Mm -hmm. The system is what supported an environment that Rewarded. created this, mm -hmm. this Trump, right? And you think of just even now with what's going on in Kavanaugh or what happened with Bill O'Reilly, like we are part of an organizational system. So the opposite of what a good man is, it's allowing somebody like Harvey Weinstein to continue to do what he's been doing for 20, 30, 40 years and getting away with it. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is the opposite of it's, it's because people knew it was wrong, but they just buried the incorrectness for some reason, instead of actually sticking up for what they knew was right and what's wrong. So I feel like it's dishonesty. It's not supporting it's, it's using that competitive advantage as a negative. Um, and that's what it's the battle piece, right? It's to win. It's the, it's when the winning is the only thing that is there. That's what I was, I find valued. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's valued more than anything else. I was at the barbershop the other day and the guy was on, you know, this athlete lost a game and he was on the thing and he's being interviewed and he's like, well, you know, winning, you know, nobody, I just didn't want to lose and I don't like losing. And it's like, well, who likes to lose? Like who wakes up in the morning? And is like, I am going to be a loser today. <laughs> You know, it's like, Ooh, I, can't wait to lose this. Yes. I can't wait to lose this game. Of course not. Right. But I, now I look at losing for ourselves. Like we just had a total business bomb, like just completely blew up. Mm -hmm. And in a way that did not get us results we expected, we lost big loss. Mm -hmm. But I know we learned so much from that in two days in the middle of the launch. I knew we screwed up mm -hmm. and it was like time to revamp the entire structure that we built so far. So for me, the opposite of a good man is this piece of abuse of power. It's, a, it's abuse of power. It's abuse of strength. It's abuse of control. And it's not this, it's, it's your answer to everything is correct. Um, I'm not going to listen to anybody. So it's, those, it's, it's just abuse of everything that exists. It's abuse of being a man. It's abuse of the power. Um, I just read the, yeah, I mean, that's basically... To me, that's the opposite of it. And I said Trump because it's easy, right? It's an easy I answer. I know. Okay. It's, it's, the common, it's the common word at this point. But it's also not because the, he, he got voted in, right? Yeah. He got yeah. voted into power. And I knew, like, I told Kate he was going to win. Hmm. And she was like, you're crazy. And I was like, no, I'm one of the people that was like, this dude could win. Because I worked in an environment for what he was talking about in North Carolina where we, I used to walk people out the door because we shut our plant down. I laid off manufacturing employees. I had to walk them out the door because it was the last day of work. We were closing our plant. I grew up in Indiana. I grew up in the, you know, the Midwest, these conversations that took place. The fact that, you know, white is not going to be the majority in the future in the United States. And that scares people, right? Because we never learned this integration piece. We never learned about it's like taking the society. We don't learn about what the rest of the world evolves into, right? So for me, it's like, it's the system and structure that's still supporting that also run by men that are keeping this thing in check that creates 
darkness. It creates the bad. And I feel like that is the, like Trump is the poster boy for toxic masculinity. And so it's easy to just say the Trump, right? And yeah. so it can be, I guess that's a bit of verb. Is that, would that be it? I'm just I'm doing the Trump today. Yeah, I think it's turning into that. A yeah. descriptor and a verb. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, so I'll be getting to my last few questions, although I could talk to you for another four hours about all of this. Um, I, I'm curious, what do you think is necessary, either from a partner or from the environment um, to support the, the good man? Let me talk from, uh, we can talk, I'll do partner first and then we'll talk about environment. Patience. I feel like from, uh, I'll just talk in my, I married to a woman, so a heterosexual relationship, but I think, I mean, every relationship, it's like figuring that out for yourself. Yeah. Like your relationship is going to be much different than mine. Mm -hmm. Um, and then everybody listening has their own unique relationship. There's not one way to do things when it comes to relationships. So it's kind of figuring that out. But I feel like with Kate, the when I look at it, that's helped me become a better person. It's been patience and it's been listening and it's been open line of communication without judgment. And I feel like that's helped us a lot. I mean, we have a business together, so it's, we have, we have to, we talk a lot, right? But I feel like that there's a bucket for, we set calendar, we set appointments in our calendar. We have a money meeting every Friday at 10, at, uh, 10 o'clock. So tomorrow at 10 o'clock, I will be having a meeting with my wife about money and it goes over our finances for the business, personal, et cetera. And then when we have a scheduling meeting during the week and it's not, and so during the week on Mondays about the rest of the week or Sunday nights. And during those times, we also bring up other stuff that might be going on. So we create buckets for us to voice what's actually taking place. So we create that structure and I feel like that's been helpful from a partner standpoint to, to support me as my, as my evolution is taking place. The one thing that in a partnership to help me become a better person is how confident and capable and concrete my wife is with her own self. And I feel like the more, because if she's lacking or she tries to take her happiness, let's just take happiness for an example, right? It's if she feels like she's going to try to get her happiness from me, then you talk about this during sex, like all your sex teaching, right? It's like pleasure, right? That's a big thing. Mm -hmm. So if she's trying to get her happiness from me, she'll never achieve it, right? And she'll never feel it. So she's all, and then I'm going to feel that pull. I'm going to be like, pressure. Oh, it's going to be exhausting for me. And if I try to go get my happiness from her, that is completely exhausting as well. There's no way that's possible because I have to sustain, be comfortable for who I am, right? Mm -hmm. So for a partnership, I feel like that's the piece that we really work well together. It's the, it's been established over time, but that communication, the open line of communication, listening to each other and asking for what each other need help with. Yeah. Since Ruby was born five months ago, I have a lot of skin problems and it has a lot, that's a, that, we talk about that for two hours. I've seen like everybody under the sun about helping it but it's been Kate's like, you got to heal yourself. So let's get it done. How can I support you? And those, that question, how can I support you is a game changer. So in our partnership for the environment, um, it's our responsibility as I'll just speak for myself as a white male, as the quote unquote patriarchy, or I guess I don't have to quote it. It's true, but like to change the environment that exists. So if I want to create a culture that is much more diverse, at, let's take our company, that's my, more diverse, that is open to allowing a place for good men to show up as well as good women in this place, it's my responsibility to set the parameters and to listen what's happening in the world to change it. And for me, it's about publicly talking about it. And I feel like that's what, it's. that's why, because, we can talk about good men are overshadowed in the environment or not heard from, but are they actually speaking up? Right. And so that's women, me too, spoke up, mm -hmm. right? Women like uh, Stormy Daniels spoke up. You know, it's like, I can't wait to read her book. I just ordered it. It's on pre-order. It's going to be, I don't know. It's just like a powerful woman voicing what's going on. Like you doing what you're doing right here to highlight good men, you're speaking up 
because to highlight these men, but that's fantastic. But like our men that you're interviewing also doing the same thing. Cause that's how we change this environment. That's how we get this. It's Mark Cuban. I don't know the whole story there, but I just saw a glimpse of what happened yesterday with his Dallas Mavericks organization. I mean, him getting on camera saying they screwed up is a start. Yeah. Now, if he knew about it, that's a different story. Did he cover things up? It's Joe Paterno saying that this never happened, but he knew about it 40 years ago, right? Like, with what happened there it's so it's us recognizing and actually having the balls let's speak in the men's term mm -hmm. to stand up and actually to, to have these conversations so that creates the change in the environment yeah. because it's not i heard uh tracy ellis ross said the best quote she has a ted talk it's like eight minutes long and she basically said it's not as a as a she was speaking to women it's not our responsibility to change men's bad behavior it's men's responsibility to change men's bad behavior and so for us to change that environment, it's for us to listen to someone like you as a woman that's sharing this is as to listen to the environment of what's going on in the Me Too movement. It's not to get defensive about it. It's not to feel like your manhood is failing because women still need us to make babies at this point. Mm -hmm. That could all change in about 30 years. But like, you know, like to make babies and keep humans going, men still have a place at this right there's beyond just making babies but there's still a place that i always find it funny because we always have a good chuckle about that with kate but there's still a place for that but it is our responsibility to make those changes and to stick up for those and to stick up for women or stick up for other men or we had a a person in our life it's still in our life but he made a comment about um puerto ricans and i won't go into more detail because it's between the two of us. And so I just like, I left the conversation and I was like, you know what? That didn't really sit well with me. That's probably not the right thing, the way to do it. Basically because they're a Puerto Rican, they couldn't do a good job is way how it was all framed up and said. Mm -hmm. And I just sent him a text and I was like, yo, this is the feeling I got from it. Just because a Puerto Rican doesn't mean there's a good job. There's plenty of white dudes that suck at doing their job too. So it's just like I summed it up from there and he came back to me with an answer that was, you know, a little bit defensive because it was, uh, it was, it was, a, it was like, I'm calling you out on your BS. And, and so, but I knew he heard the message and it's not like it, it didn't end our relationship. It didn't end our, we still have a relationship. I'll most likely still, you know, work with him down the line. Um, but it's, it's just knowing that it's a lot, it's holding, holding people accountable for what they're doing in a non yelling manner. And so, and it's, a, it's having a conversation. I'll just share this last piece because this goes to the environment. Um, so Kate's always said in our relationship that my tone aggravates her. And I'm just like, I don't know what the hell that means. This is the way I talk, right? And so it could be something that's like this, or I'll come downstairs and it'll be very excitement. Mm -hmm. I was in a therapy session like two, mo two months ago. This has been going on since we've been together. I was like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I don't know. I don't know what and she's like, it's the way you're talking to me, it's your tone. And in the therapy session, I was very excited to start it off. And, and David was like, so where are you on a scale of one to 10 on energy? And he calls it energy. Kate calls it tone. And I was like, I'm, I feel like an eight to an 8.5 to a nine. I'm in that range. And he says, yeah, true connection happens at a five or six. So let's drop it back down. So let's get, let's, I closed my eyes. I did some breathing work. I started dropping, like our conversation right now is happening at a five or six level, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was such a great piece of advice to help create this communication. There's a guy online. I posted something about the other day. Trump said, this was a goal. It goes back to like the environment, right? Mm -hmm. Trump, I, Trump made the comment about the hurricane forms that just hit South Carolina was going to be wet. And it was very wet and very tremendous. It's like, no kidding. I was like, this is speak like my third three-year-old talks, right? And I was just like, she says the same thing. The rain is wet, you know, <laughs> and it's thunder. You know, she calls it thunder. But I was like, this, my, my Penelope says the same thing. So I posted this on, I like cheeky things like this. So I posted on Facebook and I get all these comments. <laughs> Republicans, Democrats, and the whole, sh I'm like, what the, where are you guys going? And this guy starts going in on responding, like, very aggressively to everybody that's making kind of fun of the situation. So I just write back to him and I said, look, why don't we actually have a real conversation about what you're trying to point out? Because he made a comment about me and he's like, how I've changed in the past couple of years. Well, no kidding. I'm getting old, right? Mm -hmm. So 
I have a podcast. It's called Project Life with Mike Watts. Let's set aside 30 minutes to an hour. We'll actually have a real conversation like adults instead of on here like the Facebook thing. I have no judgment. I'm not trying to change your mind about anything, but I will actually want to talk to you about the way that you're viewing me. And then we can actually talk about these type of things and actually have a real discussion about it. Do you say yes? Six, six days he hasn't responded. Hmm. So for me, it's about not, I have a platform that I'm using. It's not huge, you know? It's, it's like, <laughs> it's not huge at all. But it's, my daily listens on my podcast are listened by like 120 people or my podcast, right? Myself, personal. Kate and I have one that's bigger than that. But it's like, if I can create and bring people together we can have totally, we're always going to have different views. Yeah. And so it's changing that environment to how we go about having these discussions. That person's responding to me on Facebook. You see this all the time. At like a tone of 10, 11 or 12. They're so angry. Mm -hmm. And it's like, they're angry about something that's not even brought up here. So for me, that's the way I'm looking at changing the environment. Mm -hmm. I love that. I do. And I, I feel the same way about like people who challenge something that I'm saying or doing, or uh, I love having a difference. I mean, I love having someone who thinks something different than me. I mean, I, it's honestly like, as long as there's, it's respectful, I, I want to hear it. Cause I want to change and grow. And I know my way isn't the only way. And, I, and it's the only way that we can change is if we have differences. And then I know better where I stand when I know where I don't mm -hmm. um, in that. And so I think I, I admire that. I hope he says, yes, I hope he does. I think that will be great. I, whatever. Like, it doesn't matter to me. No, I know. Um, it's just great that you offered it. And cause I am, like, I would like to have a conversation about the way he views it. And it's like, I'm totally cool with, like, if he hates my guts for the rest of his life, that's fine. I don't know. The answer is about vulnerability. Is if is he... Yeah. Is he going to, is he willing to be vulnerable and is he feeling safe and what is, what is the threat um, in that? But anyway, it's cool. Cause I, I know where, where you're coming from is that. All right. So yeah. I've got one last question. Go I'm for it. Ask of you. And if we're, you and I are sitting down uh, when you were 70 and we play this video again, what do you want your 70 year old self to think of the man right now? I'm going to like cry. It's ridiculous. Um, cause what came to mind was like, you're doing the right thing. Yeah. You know, you're on the right track. And so <laughs> I'm cry. but it's, it, it's, it, yeah. Cause it's like, I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. You oh. know, to look back at what that is and just know like you're, you're finding your true self, you know? And so that's where, whatever that means to people, but it's like that for me, it's like discovering who I am. And that way, um, cause I already know I'm a kick-ass dad, so I don't have to worry about like, oh, you crushed it at dadhood. I'm already crushing dadhood. But yeah, you're doing the right thing. That's good. Thank you, Mike Watts. Thank you for being a good man. Uh, thank you for giving us your thoughts and um, your views of things and, and for your time today. Thanks for trusting good men, you know, and putting this together. So I appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you everybody for um, watching Dr. Juliana. Thank you for listening to Man Made Conversations with Good Men. If you are interested by what you heard, please press the like button and comment in my YouTube channel and subscribe to the series. We'd also love for you to comment and share on social media platforms. If you know a good man or are a good man, contact me at drjulianamorris at gmail.com. It's D-R-J-U-L-I-A-N-A-M-O-R-R-I-S at gmail.com. Or let me know of your recommendation in the comment sections. Thank you for joining the Conversations with Good Men, Man Made.